Hello, this is Brother Krumar from the Math Department. This is a continuation of Lesson 17 dealing with inference for one proportion. Where we last left off is that we were constructing a confidence interval of, of the true proportion of Californians in favor of Proposition 8. And so let's go through another example. Okay, and pop it up here. DeWitt C. Baldwin Jr. and others conducted a larger study to assess how widespread cheating is in medical school. Elected class officers at 40 schools were invited to distribute a survey to their second year classmates. Surveys were completed by students from 31 of the 40 schools. Among all students attending the 31 schools, 62% participated in the survey, yielding a total of 2,426 surveys. Out of this group, 114 admitted to cheating in medical school. These results were published in the Academic Medicine in 1996. You would like to get a 95% confidence interval. So what I want you to do is stop the video and first determine what the point estimate is, then check the requirements, and then finally, thirdly, get uh, and interpret a 95% confidence interval. Okay, first the point estimate is just basically the sample proportion, or p hat, which is x divided by n, the number of those who admitted to cheating divided by the sample size. And that would be 0 0.047 is our sample proportion. To check the requirements, we would the requirement is met since if we take the sample size of 2,426 and times it by our sample proportion 0 0.047, that's equal to 114. And if we take that same sample size and times by one minus that sample proportion of 0 0.047, we would get a number of 2,312. Both of these two numbers are both greater than 10, so the requirement is met, so we can assume the distribution of a sample proportion is normal. Thirdly, we want to construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval of the true proportion of those who cheat at medical school, or at least those who admitted who, who would admit to cheating in medical school. Um, how we would set that up is we'd use this formula here, and what we would do is that we could take the sample proportion plus or minus the critical value 1.96 for a 95% confidence interval times the square root of our sample proportion 0 0.047 times 1 minus that sample proportion divided by our sample size to get our confidence interval. And so how we interpret that is we're 95% confident that the true proportion of students who cheat at medical school or who would at least admit to cheating at medical school is between 0 0.039 and 0 0.055. If we were to go to our, if we were to go to calculate this into Excel, we would put in, I just have to remember the numbers here, we would put in 114 and 2426 and then I would type in 0.95 for my 95% confidence interval. And then this is where I would get my two numbers for my confidence interval. Okay. So then a couple more items here. And first of all, sample size calculation. Sample size is required to estimate the population proportion with a level of confidence, 1 minus alpha times 100%. With a specified margin of error, M, and it is given by, and there's two sample size calculations. N is a sample size is equal to the critical value of z for a level of confidence divided by a specified margin of error and then we take that quantity and square it we times it by p star and then times it again by one times it also by one minus p star and p star represents a prior estimate of p if we know or we have an idea what a, what the prior estimate of p is we can put that into this equation but if we don't have a prior estimate for p or p star if we don't have a p star then we would just use this calculation where we would take the z critical value divided by two times the, the desired margin of error and we take this quantity and we square it. So for example, the desired margin of error of 3% or 0 0.03 with a 95% confidence interval for Prop 8 problem where the prior estimate of p is 0 0.60. What we would do is we put in, if we're doing 95%, the critical value is 1.96 we would divide it by the um, desired margin of error of 3% or 0 0.03 and we'd square this quantity times it by our prior estimate of 0 0.6 times 1 minus our prior estimate uh, uh, of 0.6 and then if we multiply it all together we get a, we get a number of 1024.43 which we would round up to 1025. Now if we had no prior estimate of P for this next example then what we would do is we would take 1.96 divided by two times the desired margin of error and then we would square this quantity and then notice here we get a number of 1067.11 which would be rounded up to 1068. Notice that this number is larger than this number. If we don't know the prior estimate of P, we're, we're going we're to be conservative and, and use this formula and we will get a larger number. OK? 
Okay. So what I'd like for you to do is let's look at this example here. So a desired margin of error of 3% or 0 0.03 with a 95% confidence interval for, sam for sample cases of the su superior courts in Massachusetts where the prior estimate of P is equal to 0 0.82. So if, if we have a prior estimate, we can put in um, 1.96 divided by um, 0 0.03 and then we square this quantity, and since we have a prior estimate, we times this quantity by 0 0.82 times 1 minus this prior estimate, 0 0.82, and if we solve for that, we get 630.02, and we would automatically round up to 631. Even though this is not this is less than 0.5 here to the right of the decimal, regardless, we always round up when we deal with these calculations. So here is uh, here's a couple more thoughts here. Um, a level of confidence describes the process of creating an interval that predicts the proportion P, which is unknown. So approximately 1 minus alpha times 100% of all possible confidence intervals would contain P. So if we did a 95% confidence interval, if we did a confidence interval a gazillion times, we should capture that true proportion about 95% of the time. This does not mean the probability of containing P. The interval either captured or, or did not. It's either 0 or 1, the probability of containing it. This, this statement here describes the process of, of capturing the true mean. This here is after all is said and done, what's the probability of containing or capturing the true po uh, population proportion? Okay, and this is the last slide for confidence intervals. For, if we're doing a one proportion confidence interval, we need to check some requirements. First, we need to check to see if the sample is obtained from a simple random sample. And then, as we mentioned earlier, the requirements for doing a confidence interval is n times p hat is greater than or equal to 10, and n times 1 minus p has greater than or equal to 10. If those are met, if the requirements are met here, we can assume that the distribution of p hat is normal. You can get that information if you go to your table here, and this is for the confidence interval, if, and this is what we did in the last problem. If both of these numbers here are above or greater than or equal to 10, the requirement is met, and that matched what we did in the, in the, in the last problem when we were checking requirements. Okay. Finally, with descriptive statistics, the descriptive statistics uh, for numerical would be a sample proportion or b hat, and for graphicals you can use pie charts or bar graphs. Now, I go if, if I go into SPSS and in Excel, you'd have you, these you'd have similar looking results, just it would be in Excel. And here's an example where here's a here's a bar chart, and here is a pie chart. And if you notice with either one of these two, we can get the percentage of those. This was going back to the Proposition 8 out of 1,000 who are in favor of Proposition 8. 540 were in favor of Proposition 8. So 54%, that would be our sample proportion. You can also see that reflected here in the pie chart as well, too. So this um, will continue with uh, Lesson 17 dealing with one proportion, but the next video we'll cover is hypothesis testing for one proportion.